In this lecture, I'm going to use the partition function and Boltzmann factors, our very powerful formulation, to derive the Maxwell speed distribution. Now, this is a big moment. Um, for a few classes, for a year or so, we've been showing you this Maxwell speed distribution and saying, hey, you know, we'll get to this later. Well, it's later. Here you go. Okay. Um, so, to start off with, Okay, we're going to remember that the formulation that we're using is that the probability of a state is equal to 1 over our partition function times the Boltzmann factor, which is e to the minus energy of the state divided by kT, or it could be written as e to the minus beta times e sub s, where beta is 1 over kT. Okay, now what we have to do is we have to write the energy of the state in terms of the molecular speeds. Remember that our model of an ideal gas is that these um, particles are just zipping around and that they're not attracted to one another. They don't feel any attractive or repulsive forces between nearby molecules. We're just modeling them as little, you know, sort of nanoscale billiard balls or bouncy balls that, you know, bounce off one another. So all of their energy is actually kinetic energy. So the energy of any particular um, uh, ideal gas molecule would just be its kinetic energy or one half mv squared. Okay, so that means that the probability of our state would be one over z times e to the minus beta times one half mv squared, and that's that. Okay, now we also need to find the partition function and we need to know the degeneracy because, of course, you could have multiple particles that all have the same speed, and if they have the same speed, then they would have the same energy in an ideal gas, all right? So let's place ourselves in momentum space, which we've done um, previously in other lectures, okay? And if you do that, you're plotting the momentum of your ideal gas particle on the x, y, and z components. So that becomes your axes. P sub x, P sub y, P sub z become your axes, all right? So you can envision that a particle that has a particular speed, for example, would have that speed in the vx, vy, vz components, and that the speed would be equal to the square root of the sum of the squares of the x, y, and z velocity components, okay? So this would form a sphere, in other words, in your momentum hyperspace, and the radius of the sphere would be the mass of your particle times the speed of the molecule. All right. Now, if a molecule has a particular speed, then that forms a spherical shell, okay, in your momentum hyperspace, because it has a specific speed. But you can't be exactly sure about what the speed of that molecule is, can you? Okay, you'd have some uncertainty into the molecule's speed. And that uncertainty would give you the thickness of your spherical shell. Now, any molecules that had the same speed within that uncertainty, right, would be degenerate according to your definition. And what that would mean is that the volume of your spherical shell in your momentum hyperspace would give you the degeneracy of the energy of that state. Now, what would the thickness of this be? Of course, it would be the thickness related to your Heisenberg uncertainty principle, okay? So the thickness of your spherical shell would be dictated by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Now, of course, they didn't know that back in the 1800s when they first arrived this, but they did recognize the idea maybe that there would be some uncertainty inherent in that, okay? So there we go. Okay, so we can find our degeneracy then. The degeneracy would be the volume of our spherical shell in momentum hyperspace. So that would be the surface area of our sphere, which would be, of course, the surface area of any sphere is 4 pi times the radius squared. So here that would be 4 pi v squared because our radius would be v in, um, in uh, speed hyperspace or whatever. Okay, and now times the thickness of the shell would give us the volume. So 4 pi v squared dv would give us the degeneracy for our speeds, okay, for any particular speed. So that's our degeneracy. Now, we need also to find our partition function. Remember that we are going to use the normalization condition 
in general to help us find partition function values. The normalization condition states that if you integrate over all possible probabilities, it's got to sum or, or integrate to one because it's got to be in some state, right? <laughs> With a probability of one or a, a chance of 100%. It'll be in some state. Yeah, it'll have a speed, in other words, is what you're saying. So if you integrate over all your probabilities um, from minus infinity to infinity for all your states, um, then you've got one. That's our normalization condition. Now, if we're going to, instead of integrating over states, integrate over speeds, then we have to use our Boltzmann factor for our speeds, and then multiply that times the degeneracy, and then divide by the partition function. So that ends up being the integral over all our speeds from zero to infinity, times our degeneracy, which is four pi v squared dv, times our partition function one over z, remember z is just gonna be some constant, but we've got to solve for it, and then times our Boltzmann factor, which is e to the minus beta times one half mv squared. So that's it. That's what we've got to do for our integration. Okay, now I'm not saying that's easy, but it is reduced to quadratures, as we say in physics, right? <laughs> All right, so how are we going to do this integral? We're going to first change variables. Let's make our um, exponent here uh, beta times 1 half mv squared, which is, of course, 1 half mv squared over kt, because beta is 1 over kt. We're going to let that equal to x squared. Okay, so this is a substitution. So x squared is mv squared over 2kt, which makes x the square root of m over 2kt times v, which makes dx the square root of m over 2kt times dv. Okay, then we've just got to sub in for um, dv, and dv would be the square root of 2kt over m times dx. Okay, so we're going to plug that in here, and now we've changed our variables. If we now pull all of our other constants out front, we end up with our normalization condition 1 equals 4 pi over z times 2 kt over m to the 3 halves power times the integral of x squared e to the minus x squared dx. So that's after we do our substitution. Now, yet again, this isn't a calculus class, okay? So I'm not going to spend time on YouTube Deri uh, deriving what this uh, integral evaluates to. I'll, I'll leave that to your calculus professor. You can look it up in the appendix of Schroeder's Thermal Physics textbook. Suffice it to say for now that this integral evaluates to the square root of pi over 4. You can look it up in the tables. So if you plug root pi over 4 in for your integral, you've got 1 equals 4 pi over z, 2 kt over m to the 3 halves times root pi over 4. So you can now solve for your partition function which is equal to 2, two, two pi kt over m to the 3 halves. Okay? So we've solved for our partition function. Way to go. And now we can plug that in and see what our full uh, probability is for a particular speed. We have now our function for uh, describing the probability that a, a particle in an ideal gas has a speed v. And this is also known as the Maxwell speed distribution function. Here it is. The probability of a speed v is m over 2 pi kt to the 3 halves times 4 pi v squared times e to the minus mv squared over 2 kt. So that is the function that we have been promising you that we will derive. And you have been using it in other classes. And there it is. You just proved it along with me. Yay. Now, if you plot what that looks like, you'll see that um, here it looks like this. You've got this kind of steep climb up to the maximum uh, probability speed, and then your function will decay off and it has a nice long tail. So this isn't a symmetric distribution function. It's got a longer tail than it has a beginning, okay? Now, the peak will depend upon the temperature, and it'll also depend upon the mass of the particle. Remember that uh, lighter particles have higher speeds for the same temperatures, and that higher temperatures means higher speeds, okay? Now, since this isn't a symmetric distribution function, like for example, a Gaussian or bell curve, you could fold it in half, and the left-hand side and the right-hand side would lie on top of one another, right? But that's not the case for this because of the long tail. So since that's the case, it actually you can actually use several speeds to characterize what the speed of your particles are. You can use the Vmax, which is the most probable speed, which is where the peak of your probability density is, okay? 
or you could find the average. The average um, would be just averaged over all your uh, all your possible speeds. What what's the average of that? Straight up average, or you could find the root mean square speed. Okay. Now remember, we have discussed the root mean square speed before. Um, in previous lectures, we talked about the root mean square speed as setting the kinetic energy of one half mv squared equaling two equipartition of energy, right, which is three halves kt. And then when you solve, you get the root mean square speed is three kt, square root of three kt over m. Okay, so we've derived that one before. Now, the most probable speed I can derive for you now. The most probable speed is the square root of two kt over m. Okay, so let's derive that one. What you do to find the maximum of any function is you take the derivative and you set it equal to zero. That'll give you a max or a min. Since this function only has a max, it's a max, okay? So we're going to do dp dv and set it equal to zero. Okay, here's p, right? m over 2 pi kt to the 3 halves times 4 pi v squared e to the minus mv squared over 2 kt, okay? So um, here we have it, and now what we're going to do is take the derivative of it. So that m over 2 pi kt to 3 halves, that's constant for everything. Okay, so that stays out front. And now let's look at the stuff in the curly brackets. We're going to use the product rule, of course, to uh, find the derivative. So remember, if you've got two functions, f and g, that are each functions of some variable, and you're multiplying times one another, then to find the derivative of f times g, it's derivative of f times g plus, right, derivative of g times f. So that's what we're doing here. So the 4 pi v squared is the first function. If you take the derivative of it, you get 8 pi v. And then you multiply it times your second function, which is that e to the minus mv squared over 2 kt. Now you add on the second one where you leave the 4 pi v squared alone, and you take the derivative of e to the minus mv squared over 2 kt. So when you take the derivative of any exponential, you get the exponential back and then times the derivative of the power that the exponential is raised to. So that's uh, the derivative of minus mv squared over 2 kt, which is minus 2 mv over 2 kt, and then times the exponential again, e to the minus mv squared over 2 kt. Now, the sum of those two terms is equal to zero. And so um, what we're going to do then is just move one of them over to the other side. So first of all, I've got this constant out front. Since it multiplies everything, I can cancel it out. And then that leaves me with a pi v e to the minus mv squared over 2 kt is equal to 4 pi v squared times mv over kt times e to the minus mv squared over 2 kt. The 2 cancels out here in this fraction top and bottom, and um, the minus sign gets rid of it when you go to the other side with the replacing the 0. Now let's finish this up. So I've transferred this from the previous slide, 8 pi v, e to the minus mv squared over 2 kt equals 4 pi v squared, mv over kt, e to the minus mv squared over 2 kt. Okay, that's a recap. And now we're going to cancel out stuff. I love canceling out. So this exponent, uh, exponential appears on both sides. Whack, whack, it goes away. The pi appears on both sides. Whack, whack, it goes away. The 8 and the 4 cancels out, leaving 2 on the left-hand side. Yay, okay, and then we have this v multiplying from the 8 pi v canceling out with the mv over, with the v inside the mv over kt, right? So then all that's left in this is 2 is equal to v squared times m over kt. That's it. That's all we got. So now if you move everything that's not v squared over to the other side of the equation, you have uh, 2 kt over m is equal to v squared, and take the square root of that, and you've got your max um, speed. And by max speed, I mean it's the speed that is at the maximum of the probability distribution or probability density. Okay, that's what I mean by Vmax, the V that gives you the max probability. Okay, so that's the square root of 2kt over n. So that's the approach to finding Vmax. Now for homework, um, I generally assign finding the average speed. Okay, so my hint for that is what you have to do is you have to think about what our definition with an average was for a distribution function, okay? If that's ringing some bells, go back to the lecture on distribution functions and look for what the average is, how to find an average, okay? All right, so to recap, this Maxwell speed distribution function gives you the probability that a particular particle in an ideal gas has a speed. You can integrate this Maxwell speed distribution function and get the probability, right, 
of a range of speeds. So if you want to know, for example, what's the probability that my gas molecule is going between 500 and 1000, you could integrate P of V with respect to V between those two speeds, and it would give you that probability. That's what distribution functions do, okay? Now, in coming lectures, we're going to take this a step further. This is the distribution of speeds in an ideal gas, which is the probability that a single molecule has a particular speed. But if we wanted to write a partition function for an entire ideal gas of n molecules, we'd have to do more work. In other words, you guessed it. It's coming up. We're going to derive the sacker tetrod equation. <laughs> yeah, that's where we're going to end up with all of this. Okay. So we're going to show that the ideal gas, of course, the ideal gas is a non-interacting, indistinguishable molecule, right? And if you have n of them, then what you would do to find the partition function for n molecules would be to take the partition function for one molecule and raise it to the power of n and then divide by n factorial. Now, partition function for one molecule raised to the n power, that kind of makes sense. And then the 1 over n factorial, that comes from the fact that really doesn't matter how you order ideal gas molecules. You can't tell them apart. Now, why does the power thing make sense? Well, remember that if you were talking about the multiplicity, okay, for microstates, in order to get the total multiplicity for interacting particles, you multiply the multiplicities. And so it kind of makes sense that you would do the same thing for the partition functions, doesn't it? Right? So if they're identical, then all the partition functions should be basically the same, and you raise them to the nth power. The order doesn't matter, so you divide by n factorial. All right? So that's coming up. Those are the ideas that we're going to use um, in our quest to uh, find the uh, distribution function for ideal gas molecules, and then eventually to derive the Sacker tetrode. See you then.